so this presentation is a very brief or broad overview about what exactly is the design of underground structures because design of underground structures by itself is a very vast and deep area and uh, with the availability of time uh, we can just have a very brief overview about it so this presentation i have just kind of created it with a very uh, inquisitive nature so uh, like i have put in a lot of questions and uh, those questions are kind of uh, uh, answered or the questions are going to be explored to be honest so getting into the first question so so the concept is first we are going to look at into a very macro concept so why do we generally need metro structures in india so this is a very common question actually if you kind of look uh, indian population we are kind of very densely populated and we are the second largest populated country in the world so we have almost one sixth of the population and uh, there is a huge disparity in the population density concentration in india there is a huge amount of population concentrated in the cities or the urban areas and there is a very sparing population in the rural areas this primarily happened because uh, there was a huge amount of urbanization and most of the employment or jobs are kind of concentrated in cities particularly metros like chennai uh, bombay delhi and kolkata so what i kind of happened is there is an imperative need for a good public transport system and uh, unfortunately a country like india with this amount of size and this amount of population uh, we don't have a good uh, public transport system so i guess uh, we all would have traveled in uh, the uh, buses uh, rural buses in our own cities say for example if you assume chennai you would have uh, made there is this metropolitan transport uh, is kind of having a transport system but if you kind of look at the buses most of the buses are kind of uh, worn out they are in their dying stages and uh, they don't give you good facilities and on the other hand they don't uh, maintain their time punctuality is a very poor uh, phenomena in india and uh, these roads don't i mean these roads and these buses don't offer you good uh, punctual transport system and on the other hand like uh, the roads are also very poorly maintained and poorly uh, kind of constructed in india in most of the cities because it uh, we, we just developed in a very haphazard manner and uh, if you kind of look the interconnectivity through roads is also very uh, not so good if you take for example chennai you can't reach one corner of the place with the other corner which with just one bus or something like that so they are kind of poorly interconnected you need to take uh, one or two stops here and there to get connected so these all parameters coupled together kind of makes an imperative need of why metro structures are needed in india and currently they are primarily concentrated in the urban areas based because of the reason which i was uh, just telling around and uh, now getting into the next question why elevated or why not underground so basically uh, you would have kind of seen elevated metros and underground metros and uh, say for example if you take uh, just for better visualization if you take a place like chennai the metro is composed of both underground structures and uh, elevated structures but what is the primary difference between elevated structures for elevated metro and underground metro is uh in the context of elevated metro the analogy the design analogy is quite similar to a normal bridge it might be a road bridge or a railway bridge the only major difference what you are going to have is the loading pattern uh, the car loads are going to vary and uh, otherwise the construction methodology or the construction sequence or all this is just going to be very synonymous with regards to any bridge which you kind of cons construct but one problem what happens around elevated structure is uh, the context of uh, land acquisition uh, although india is a country where uh, you don't have a fundamental right for your property 
but still uh, uh, getting land or land acquisition in metros is a quite a huge task because the property values are quite huge so a lot of legal constraints comes into play and these legal constraints have to be sorted out by the contractor because the client doesn't does it so these all adds to the cost of the project and uh, these factors make elevated uh, metro a bit uh, a uh, low when compared to underground structures so where is underground structures primarily going to be so facilitate everything okay maybe in the context of legal constraints if they do reduce your legal constraints but uh, the underground structures is kind of going to throw its own uh, uh, intricacies and difficulties because you're going to explore uh, the underground or the you're going to play with geostrata the major advantage is you don't get into a lot of legal constraints and the space crunch with regards to concentrated cities is also kind of sorted out so this is why kind of nowadays underground metros or underground stations are kind of preferred when compared to elevated structures so getting into another question like is elevated metro feasible in india like uh, to be honest underground metro structures or underground structures in general it's not of recent origin in india it has been uh, constructed and it has been existing in quite a long time in the northern part of the india and northeastern part uh, and uh, several strategic projects pertaining to military have worked on underground structures but what is the problem is these structures although they were constructed and designed there was not a large amount of knowledge transfer happening in the context and uh, so like everything is happening from the scratch in the context of underground metros and uh, fortunately india is uh, having a decent uh, strata soil strata uh, we are not like brunei where country, brunei is a country where it is filled with clay and uh, even for normal roads they go for piling so fortunately we have good strata and uh, additionally most of the metro cities and uh, uh, all the urban areas in india are acute uh, shortage of water so the water tables are quite uh, low and this facilitates us a lot in terms of excavation so you can kind of excavate and the water tables are quite low so these parameters kind of make underground metro very much feasible in a country like india so are underground structures costly like uh, there was a notion uh, like maybe 7 or 8 years back that underground structures are uh, quite costly and to a certain extent it was too true also to be honest uh, but if you look the reason behind it is like we didn't have the technical expertise or the technology to kind of uh, do underground uh, structures by our own we had to depend on a lot of uh, foreign consultants and we had to depend on a lot of foreign technology and we were not also very clear like how to kind of construct the construction methodologies were not clear there was a lot of trial and error being done and uh, so it kind of added the time and the cost and additionally uh, there was an acute shortage of uh, skilled labor so uh, people didn't know how to kind of uh, construct or there was a lot of lack of labor kind of issues and uh, the design process by itself it was quite laborious in nature there were several levels of uh, getting clearance like uh, once you design there was another level who kind of who gave you kind of clearance and then you had to go to another level so this by itself increased the timeline of the project and thereby it was very laborious to get design approvals and clearances all these factors made underground structures costly but of late uh, we are reaching a very optimal level on the terms of cost so can underground structures be standardized standardization is a very broad concept which maybe i my personal opinion is we kind of borrowed it uh, from ford uh, for the model t assembly line and uh, if you kind of look at the structural engineering maybe from the known area if you take a building mostly the lintels and all these structures are kind of standardized so that they are kind of used in a repetitive nature but in the context of underground structures can they be unstandardized yes it's a partial yes and it's a partial no so 
what is partial as and what is partial no the tunnels can be standardized whereas if you look at the underground metro stations they cannot be standardized because they have uh, their own intricacies and design issues and uh, once the tunnels are standardized it's just the segments are going to be cast and executed that's it and uh, getting into the next question of whether tunnels versus metro stations like as i mentioned earlier like tunnels you can kind of standardize them so once you it gets standardized so the reason behind uh, it allows you to standardize it's you, you get the benefit of shape in the case of tunnel whereas in the case of metro stations you don't get a benefit of shape so what happens is you have to get into a detailed design in most of the case but in the context of machinery uh, tunnels require a lot of heavy machinery and heavy equipment and uh, these equipments are quite costly uh, whereas metro stations you might need some form of heavy machinery but uh, you 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 don't need that much of a cost of on equipment in the context of uh, uh, metro stations if you just look into the working conditions the working conditions of tunnels are very tough because uh, you need lot of uh, uh issues with regards to heat and ventilations whereas you don't have that much tough conditions in the context of metros so the last question in the macro context is service life as you might all be aware that the limit state uh, we are kind of using for nowadays most of the designs it is collapse and serviceability and uh, all of us know that collapse is primarily intended towards the safety and stability and uh, with regards to the last question or as i was kind of telling in the context of service life like uh, indian standards doesn't allow uh, how do i put uh, we we just have 100 years or something like that but uh, nowadays most of the clients they kind of demand you to give a service life of more than 100 years so you have to are you are liable to kind of uh, providing a service life of more than that in that context you have to do a particular durability analysis and you have to refer to a uh, various uh, standards and uh, then only you can kind of work on it and uh, so what happens is there is a need for uh, a change in the construction methods and uh, the materials which are being uh, deployed so that is how it is varied in terms of service life so getting into the next part like uh, this is a very broad as we have just dealt with the macro context of what is exactly happening with the underground structures we are now going to jump into the micro context so this is nothing but what exactly is happening inside a design office say for example the concept is idealized by the architect so the architect is going to give you the concept but one parameter or one change in the context of uh, underground metros is mostly clients provide you the drawing so basically the role of architect is not much uh, clearer so they don't do much of concept based design rather they just do some part of uh, tweaking and detailing and all the stuff although some clients are a bit receptive they allow you to do uh, a complete concept design because there is a cost factor connected to it and then once you kind of get the input from the architect uh, then the structural engineer and the geotech engineer and in this case rock mechanics and tunnels we all sit together and we are just going to work on the engineering stuff and the mep it's more of a very supportive role they are going to give you some details on regarding their openings and all those stuff and uh, this process is primarily very iterative in nature it is not going to be a routine process it's not just you get an input and you just work on it and give an output rather it is very iterative in nature and uh, again what happens is if you kind of compare it with buildings like a geotechnical engineer's role is hardly going to be they just give you a, a safe bearing capacity and their role is done but here they are going to have equal importance they are going to play a major role and the same works in the context of rock mechanics and uh, tunnels and one interesting area one critical area which we never kind of explore much in uh, about ground structure is the interaction between the structure and the strata so but in the case of underground structure what happens is uh, there is an imperative need that you have to provide maximum importance to such kind of interaction 
and uh, so that gains more of an importance in the context of underground structures so this area or this is what exactly happens within a design office in a micro context and what exactly happens in this space is you are subjected to a lot of ideation you are subjected to a lot of uh, conflicts but at the end of the day you're going to get a, a good uh, beneficial or a good uh, solution which is going to serve the society and uh, getting into the next part which is the fundamentals uh well now we are just going to concentrate we have just seen a macro context we just saw a micro context and now we are just going to look into a very concentrated area of uh, structural engineering fundamentals in the context of uh, underground uh, structures so my first question based on the inquisitive nature how i have just framed this presentation like is earth pressure in retaining walls are they going to be same or are they going to be different or if so why so i guess everyone would have somehow done calculations on uh, retaining walls in your engineering curriculum and uh, fortunate if you're fortunate enough you would have even visualized retaining walls along the roads and uh, in the context of commercial buildings as uh, basement walls and uh, generally there are two well known prominent theories available which on basis we calculate the earth pressure which is rankine and coulomb but of course there are more specialized theories which are play a primary role uh, in the underground structures since it is very deep into theoretical concept i'll just take it from the known area to unknown so like rankine and coulomb coulomb will concentrate so generally the rankine and coulomb there is a fundamental difference on the context of the assumptions so what happens is mostly it's like a rule of thumb people kind of for uh, retaining walls of roads they go for column or ranking but uh, ranking but uh, whereas for buildings they go for ranking but it's more of a thumb rule rather uh, kind of uh, the assumptions if they are going to vary then people kind of modify the theories accordingly and while calculating the earth pressure we all know we will be calculating the active passive mostly but in the context of underground you need to give importance to at rest as we all know like active is going to be where your soil is going to push and your passive is going to be your wall is going to push the soil and at rest it's quite different from both and uh, if you i would like to idealize yourself that you're kind of walk your i guess you would have all walked through a subway uh, across all cities so if you kind of walk through a subway if you kind of idealize this structure this structure and the analogy is quite similar or is the fundamentals for your underground structural design or in the context of earth pressure at rest to be precise so this is where the earth pressure at rest comes and there are several combinations in which you're going to calculate and earth pressure at rest would give you a large or a very coherent or a different dimension in the context of underground structures and getting into the next question so what structural system is needed if so why so just to ask you as as i was telling you to idealize uh, yourself walking through a subway like uh, or visualize so now this subway is typically speaking it is like going to be like a box structure so what is a box structure box structure is nothing but you're going to get your symmetric bmds and all is going to be like very symmetrical in nature so this box structure logic is the primary foundation which you need to think and you can even idealize it as a culvert uh, if you want but uh, a subway is more precise uh, so if this box structure what happens you don't you cannot take it for all because your span of your uh, structures will kind of be quite uh, high or huge so in that context just uh, two walls supporting a slab will not suffice the issue so you need to introduce columns so you it the cost when you're going to add columns the system is going to be a combination of your columns and your walls and uh, what happens is generally here the architect will come into play the architects they don't like beams or they are kind of quite uh, uh, a bit <laughs> evasive with regards to uh, beams so they kind of ask for flush slabs so obviously you have to go for flat slabs so the system is going to be a flat slab with columns and walls so this is how a typical uh, structural system is going to be there for an underground metro station so what happens is uh, the thickness if you kind of look at the thickness of these elements 
since it's going to be underground and there's going to be huge load and the spans are going to be huge, you'll be getting a bit huge sizes. Say, for example, you will be working with a size range of 1000 to even 2500 mm. And uh, it would be quite uh, massive structures in nature. And uh, next one, what we are going to look into is, is the seismic force. I have intentionally put it as seismic force, rather it is typically speaking a displacement. So a seismic displacement is going to cause you impact in any structure. And uh, again, let me just take it from the known to unknown. If you are going to design a G plus 30 or something like structure in say, for example, Agartala or maybe Delhi, where the zone is going to be five or four respectively, your forces are going to be huge and your elements are going to be uh, massively impacted by the seismic force. But whereas if you kind of uh, look into the context of underground structures and our Indian standards, particularly 1893, what they kind of do is they just give you a reduction factor for AH and they kind of, uh, they don't give a detailed guideline, uh, to be honest. So what happens is you have to go for an uh, additional literature research and uh, you have to find the existing theories. And nowadays we have, you, we are currently using an approach theory, which the client kind of is repetitively asking. And uh, But what on the whole is kind of the, the effect of seismic force in underground structure is not going to be a predominant factor because the structure is kind of shielded all around by either rock or soil. So the impact is going to be hugely uh, decreased when compared to an above ground structure. And uh, getting into a next area, which is the thermal force or thermal stress. Like uh, the Indian standards kind of allows you to go for 45 meters without an expansion joint. And uh, this is primarily to release the stresses caused due to thermal forces. So why do we need uh, this expansion joint? Is as the thermal stresses exceed, they just, it's going to cause a problem. But what happens if you say, for example, I idealize maybe Chennai. So Chennai has a temperature variation of close to like from 18 degrees to say, for example, 40 or 45. So there's going to be 25 degrees of temper temperature variation. And what is this is going to cause is huge forces and huge stresses. And this is the reason why uh, expansion joint becomes critical in above ground structures. But whereas if you look at underground structures, what happens is you don't have uh, that kind of a temperature difference. Although there's going to be a very negligible temperature difference, the impact is going to be very, very minimal. So what happens is it allows you to go for structures with even the length of almost 200 meters without uh, use of expansion joints. So thermal forces is quite different in the context of underground structures. And now getting into temporary structures, if you kind of idealize a building uh, just to get better clarity, say for example in building structures, the temporary structures are hardly going to be there for weeks or months. Uh, but if you look at in the context of underground structures, they are going to play a huge role. They are going to be there for maybe like the entire construction duration, maybe three years or even five years in worst cases. So what happens is they have to be working like a temporary bridges to kind of maneuver the traffic and all those stuff. So what happens generally is uh, the, the excavation is going to be huge. You're going to excavate, say, for example, 100 by 50 by 25 or something like that. Now, when you make a huge excavation of that uh, volume with 50 meters or something like that. So what kind of happens is you have to retain the strata, either it's going to be soil or it's going to be rock, whatever case. So now generally in buildings, we kind of use uh, kind of sheet piles or soil nailings. But whereas in the context of underground structures, what we kind of use is we deploy seekin piles. So let's not get deep into seekin piles. So the fundamental work of what a seekin pile is, it is going to retain uh, your earth pressure or it's going to retain the earth or uh, rock strata. So what happens is when you deploy this Seekin pipe, additionally, you need to kind of place valors and struts. So struts are just going to run uh, between the Seekin piles and valors are going to run along the uh, length of the Seekin pipe. And uh, additionally, you might need columns to support these struts. So you're going to deploy plunge columns. 
and what happens these all elements are going to be fundamentally made out of steel and they are basically steel structures and what happens is in perm in buildings kind of you kind of make the construction sequence with the context of the permanent structures but here the temporary the preference is given like to create a better maneuverance of the temporary structures sometimes even the construction sequence for the uh, permanent structures are modified from top bottom to bottom top etc so temporary structures has its own role in uh, underground uh, station design and lastly what we are going we are going to look is uplift look we would have all done calculations for uplift for underground water tanks where we will be considering conditions where the tank is empty or tank is full just to get a visual context and just telling it so what happens is when we kind of uh, check for the uplift we have different load combinations based on y8875 part 5 So what happens? We have to just check it. But what exactly happens? Despite there is going to be huge loads uh, and huge element to member weight, what generally happens is there will be problems in the context of uplift uh, in underground structures. So when uplift or uh, issues happen in above rise structures, what generally we do is we just kind of anchor it. So a similar concept of anchor we deploy. but what is like we just don't use the uh, normal anchors as our uh, we kind of opt for this tension piles so ag- again uplift and all these parameters are quite different from what exists in a quite normal structural design so once you kind of understand these fundamental differences uh, in the context of underground metros then you can kind of have a brief or broad understanding about how the load transfer will be or how the load paths would be there so that it would kind of facilitate a better understanding so getting into the next part which is the state of the art so i generally have a sense of feeling that uh, civil engineering or, or structural engineering basically is not that technically or technologically advanced uh if you kind of take say for example mechanical engineering or other fields of engineering there has been loads of technological development and robotics etc etc but civil engineering is quite still we are living in a flintstone era where we are still very labor intensive although there are few technological advancements and uh, so it's kind of maybe to be honest it's more in the evolving stage and uh, i guess everyone will be aware of bim or bim 360 so primarily we deploy this to understand uh, what exactly will happen in the modeling phase we just do it for to understand the clashes and uh, to get a visual walk through and nowadays it's kind of even given uh, the access is given to more of a uh, site also so that they get a realistic picture of what is happening and the post sequences and all are kind of uh, modeled and uh, we executed based on that non linear dynamic analysis this is an age old topic if you just going to look into the context of buildings of above rise about ground structure but what is uh, different is like since there was a huge shortage of commercial softwares um, or exactly speaking com- much many commercial softwares no are not precisely uh, good for uh, underground structures so like initially people were just deploying a box structure kind of concept while analyzing it and now we are kind of using more of this dynamic part of analysis uh, in kind of underground structures so plane and block elements these are just a uh, basic understanding and i guess everyone will be aware of what is one line uh, di- element two line element and a three dimensional element so based on that context you are going to model it and uh, you will be getting a very precise results when you are going to use the appropriate elements for uh, the appropriate uh, uh, structural elements and boundary conditions like uh, boundary conditions like previously people were using very primitive boundary conditions like they were using pin supports and they were kind of uh, getting a um, picture but in the context of with regards with uh, the structural interaction with the uh, structure and your strata your pin and all is not going to give you a very realistic uh, impact so now uh, we have kind of evolved to a very realistic uh, boundary condition and uh, so it is quite giving a very realistic picture of how the structure is going to 
uh, evolve or play. And as I had mentioned earlier, like uh, the structural interaction, it is kind of evolved a lot. And uh, and we all know what is uh, finite uh, element uh, modeling, almost like today, every structural problem, not only in the context of uh, civil engineering, but in the context of aerospace and in the context of uh, mechanical engineering, FEM is a common tool which is deployed to kind of solve all the structural problems. And uh, getting into the next part of evolution, as I was mentioning, like previously, mostly the box structures were just uh, uh, kind of used to calculate and to get a picture on the structural uh, engineering or structural analysis. And now we have evolved to a more second order uh, uh, effect. So we are kind of getting the second order effects. And uh, we are kind of, uh, although some cases because of the mass signal of the elements, it's not much, but still uh, there is uh, an evolution towards second order uh, in the context of underground. And as I had mentioned earlier, like seismic forces, they are quite evolving. And uh, nowadays there are a lot of uh, particular literature and uh, journals which are working primarily on uh, seismic forces in the context of underground. And uh, it would evolve uh, still because it's a very growing area in the context of underground structures. And looking at the cost, uh, the cost has significantly evolved. Say, for example, some seven or eight years back, what was costing for a project? Now, hardly one third of it is, is costing. So people have kind of got a lot of experience. We have learned a lot from uh, what we have kind of doing. And uh, the cost has significantly reduced. And uh, with regards to business competition, uh, since there is a bit of knowledge development and we kind of know what is uh, how to do it, uh, and there is an increase in the competition, and uh, even there is a competition from international players from China, and uh, fortunately now off late with regards to an increased uh, nationalist approach, these people are nowadays not getting into much into the global tender form. But still, the competition is uh, highly acute. Uh, projects are lost in hardly one or two crores and all. So it's a very, very sensitive area. It's a very interesting area also. And uh, if you kind of look into the context of uh, metros, whether they are going to come to India on a further, yes. Uh, the Indian budget, recent budget has also allocated a lot of funds and uh, uh, the metro light and uh, other features have been deployed. So most of the tier two cities will also get metros in the near future rather than just concentrating on tier one uh, uh, cities. So concept of diaphragm. So I don't know whether you, I guess in concept of diaphragm in the above rise structures is very prominently known and it is primarily deployed to understand the lateral forces Whereas in underground structures, it is not quite evolved. It is uh, getting evolved because there are a lot of uh, uh, difficulties which it faces in the context when it is going to be uh, surrounded by strata. So, uh, it, but still it is evolving and the people, there are a lot of research and literature going on it. And again, as I had mentioned earlier, in the context of boundary conditions, there has been a significant uh, evolution uh, from uh, maybe a decade or back. And uh, getting into the context of uh, career path or job opportunities, like uh, a structural engineer, like this is a very, very uh, confined or niche market to be precise, the market uh, metro structures. Like it demands a lot of knowledge transfer and it demands a lot of understanding of structural concepts. It's not very routine, like uh, designing a normal building. Uh, it demands a lot of uh, understanding of structural concepts. So you can either shift to or have a profile or you can kind of have a liking towards permanent structures or temporary structures. Because if you look into the context of underground, both have its own uh, importance uh, and its own uh, play. And if you're going to look into permanent structures, it's more of going to be uh, concrete structures and you will not have much of uh, steel structures play, although you have a few, but not much. But if you're going to look into the context of temporary structures, it would be predominantly dominated by steel structures. 
and uh, you will have a very few uh, concrete uh, elements or structures to be designed. So either way, as a structural engineer or analysis, you can kind of have uh, a very decent career path in these two variants. Well, geotechnical engineers, rock specialists, and tunnel engineers. Actually, geotechnical engineers' role and importance is very huge in the context of underground. So they gain prominence uh, when compared to other structural designs. Here, they play a very vast role. And uh, what happens in the context of rock specialization and tunnel engineers, India has a very, very acute shortage in this area. There are only very few premier institutions which provide uh, qualifications in the context of uh, rock mechanics and uh, rock expertise. And the tunnel, we have very few tunnel engineers. And even today, most of the metros which are being constructed have uh, tunnel consultants from uh, abroad. So we have very few tunnel experts. And uh, it's a very good area to explore, actually, tunnel engineering. And uh, there are several firms in India uh, which are kind of uh, providing opportunities to in the field of uh, underground uh, design. I have just listed a few, but still there are a lot of firms. But what exactly happens with these firms or mostly is they don't give you real time uh, to understand and uh, analyze and learn the structure because most of these projects are very fast track, like 36 months 48 months 36 is now like a very large time they are even demanding less so they don't allow you much to learn so you can kind of it is primarily your own interest you need to learn and uh, like uh, fortunately now there are some japanese consultants also getting into the market because uh, our uh, chennai phase two will be predominantly a uh, japanese uh, sponsor will play a key role and uh, they are kind of bringing their own consultants from Japan and uh, they are kind of creating a base in India. And uh, I guess you will all be aware of this uh, bullet train or high speed, which is kind of uh, between Wapi and Vadodara in Gujarat. And even for that, uh, there's a lot of Japanese consultants coming in to give their own opinion and uh, their own suggestions. And uh, there are other few uh, infrastructure projects, not particularly pertaining to metros, but uh, they, they, are, they are also like having their own Japanese impact. Nevertheless, if you feel that you like this concept or like the field of underground structures, always research is kind of open to it. There is a lot of research happening in India in underground structures and abroad, there's a lot of opportunities in the context of underground research. So like there are very specialized courses in many parts of the Western world for tunnel engineering and uh, rock specialization and all. So if you're very interested and very particularly like you like it, you can kind of explore those areas. And uh, I guess in, in when you kind of do research, you don't have a control over you. You can kind of explore your own uh, uh, design or your own style of approach and research whereas in the context if you just go and explore in a confined job environment you will obviously have some form of control on your style of learning and in your style of uh, understanding the context so that sums up my presentation